Okay, we're talking, the title that we're moving through again is Don't Press Send. This is our third installment in this series. And of course, the sub-theme here that we're getting to is the importance of developing self-control. That if someone says they have an anger problem, they don't really have an anger problem, they have a character flaw. It's called a lack of the fruit of the Spirit. They have something missing rather than something there that they shouldn't have there. There's something missing that trumps the problem that they have. The something missing is bearing the fruit of the Spirit, because one of the fruit that we will bear if we stay close to the Lord and let Him transform us is self-control. As you see at the top of your outlines, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. Long-suffering, that means you don't blow your top, that means you're able to deal with a lot of garbage without losing the victory all the time. Long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. When someone is faithful, then I know that they're bearing, that's one of the fruit of the Spirit. They stay faithful. When someone is unfaithful, guess what they are in effect? They're double-minded. They say they'll do something and they don't do it. And the Bible says that someone who's double-minded will be unstable in all the rest of their ways. And they're as unreliable as an achy tooth and a foot out of joint. It appears as though on the outside that there's nothing wrong with it, but when you put pressure on it, it all collapse. So please, stay close to the Lord and understand that you can work on issues, but the most important thing you could do is draw close to the Lord, let Him transform you so that you bear the fruit of the Spirit. Because when we bear good fruit... That fruit will trump all of the issues that we have. Um, now, let's go to Roman numeral one. I mean, two. <laughs> How to manage your mouth and your actions. Remember, what we're getting at really here is how to develop self-control and the importance of developing self-control. Now, um, you see in that scripture toward the top of your notes there in the top section, where James said in James 3, 5, and 6, right there in your notes, it says, the tongue is a small thing, but what, an enorm what enormous damage your tongue can do. A great forest can be set on fire by one tiny spark. The tongue can turn our whole lives into a blazing flame of destruction and disaster. Isn't that true? A word here and a word there. How many of you know that words are important? So, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, this, was, uh, this was a real-life example from years ago of an ad that was put, an announcement, rather, that was put in a small-town newspaper. And, of course, the subtext here is sometimes it's better to leave bad enough alone and think through your words the first time. On Monday, this was the, this was the announcement placed in this small-town paper. Monday, for sale. R.D. Jones has one sewing machine for sale. His phone number's on there. It says, after 7 p.m., and asks for Mrs. Kelly, who lives with him cheap. <laughs> that didn't go over well. The newspaper was contacted, so here's the retraction on Tuesday. Notice, we regret having erred in the R.D. Jones ad yesterday. It should have read... One sewing machine for sale, cheap, phone number, blah, blah, blah. And ask for Mrs. Kelly, who lives with him after 7 p.m. <laughs> that didn't go over well. So in typical fashion, the newspaper does yet another retraction or correction. And here's what it says in Wednesday's paper. Notice, R.D. Jones has informed us that he has received several annoying and rude telephone calls because of the error that we made in his classified ad for the last two days. His ad stands correct as follows. For sale, R.D. Jones has one sewing machine for sale. Cheap, phone number, blah, blah, blah. Uh, call at night and ask for Mrs. Kelly who loves with him. <laughs> Another disaster. <laughs> this was in the days where morals were important, you understand, this is years ago. And then finally it comes to Thursday now. This is the fourth day of this nightmare. <laughs> Notice, I, R.D. Jones, have no sewing machine for sale. I have smashed it to bits. 
don't call, and he puts his number there, as my phone has now been disconnected. I have not been carrying on with Mrs. Kelly until yesterday she was my housekeeper, but she has since quit. <laughs> the importance of words. John Paul Sartre said words are like loaded pistols. We have to be careful how we use them. So, the greatest destroyer is what? An uncontrolled tongue. Here we go. Roman numeral two. How to manage your mouth and your actions. This is ground that we've covered, so let's go quickly here. Number one, always think before you speak or act. Boy, if you just take a few seconds to think, it will spare you from saying things you shouldn't, and it will give you time to formulate words that you should. Number two, always speak the truth before internal resentment begins. And you see there, right there in your notes, Proverbs 10.10, 10, under point two, someone who holds back the truth causes trouble. And the second scripture, Proverbs 24.26, right there in your notes, says, an honest answer is the sign of true friendship. Now, how many of you know that communication is vital in any relationship? Good communication is strategic. It is vital. No relationship can thrive without good, honest, and effective communication. That means you have to set time aside to actually communicate. And I believe now more than ever, you've got to be deliberate and intentional about your communication. Because things are so busy now, things just seem so crazy, that it's a rare, rare thing for families to be able to sit down together and actually have a meal. How many of you discovered that? Yeah. It's a treat now when we can sit down and have a meal. And we covet that time. We have to get our calendar, our mutual calendars out, and we have to plan times where our kids and their spouses, we can actually all get together in one place at one time. And then we say, okay, good. Does that work for you? Works for you? Works for you? All right, works. All right, block everything else around it. Circle the wagons. We'll meet you at the restaurant. Because those times are important. Those times should be precious. You cannot have a growing, thriving, developing, deepening relationship, whatever the context of relationship, without good, meaningful, meaningful, intentional communication. Because ships passing in the night don't do each other much good other than a wave. It's good to see Manny Maldonado and Heather back from their honeymoon. Good to have you back, guy. I saw you without my glasses on, too. That's really amazing. <laughs> Always speak the truth be before internal resentment begins. Uh, if you don't talk about things, if you don't discuss things, then what? Things build up, and sooner or later, someone's going to begin to be an historian. And when it does come out, three years' worth of aggravation or frustration, or I should have said this three years ago, yeah, you're right. And because you didn't, you have no right saying it now. Because now that's history, but you want to throw it into this gigantic agenda of beefs that you have. And so by the time you're done with that... You've dismantled the person. There's nothing constructive that will come out of that. You've demolished the situation. You've demolished the person because you've gone on a 30-minute tirade of all the things you should have said for the last three years. Now, how many of you know, had you said something three years ago, you could have nipped it right in the bud and discussed things at that level before it needed to go nuclear? Are you with me? That's why the Bible says right here, an honest answer is the sign of true friendship. Good communication is actually loving that other person. Number three, this is very, very important. Speak the truth in love, not anger. It's important that you speak the truth in love. But if you speak the truth in anger... That's not love. <laughs> anger is anger. 
And just because something is true, if it's spoken in anger, it's not going to accomplish the mission unless your mission is hurting the other person. If your mission is reconciliation, restoration, connectedness, working things out, then speaking in anger is not going to accomplish that. Because anger changes your tone, it causes the other person to draw back, get defensive, or just get torn to pieces and their feelings hurt. Right? Or it gets them to react or respond accordingly. Now, what are you going to accomplish when your conversation is going like this and escalating up? Nothing good is going to come out of that. So it's important that you speak the truth early, but you speak the truth when you do, that it's in love. That means that you actually have love as your motivation for speaking the truth. Love. That means you're loving the other person. It doesn't mean that the other person has become your personal project. It doesn't mean that you're set in their life to correct them, unless you're a parent. What it means is, if you're going to have any kind of friendship, then truthfulness is imperative. And you've got to speak the truth. That means you speak the truth and you have to be open to the truth. Now, how many of you know that in a marriage, that's, I mean, that's just life or death there. And so if you establish that early on in your relationship, in your relationships, that when you get into a marital setting, then you can carry that kind of model and those desires into a relationship. And that activity will be beneficial and not destructive. Um, if you speak in anger then that's really not going to produce good fruit. Look, look at uh, the scriptures under point three here. It says, Thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but wisely spoken words can heal. That means, potentially, that there are two different ways or multiple ways in which the same thing can be said. One leaves the person wounded and hurt, be feeling belittled, or cut down, the other one actually brings healing to that person. The other approach. Second scripture says, some people like to make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise soothe and heal. There are some people that never cease to amaze me. They insult almost everybody except the Pope, and they wonder why they can't make good and, and maintain good relationships. It's because their conception of speaking the truth is just means speaking something that according to them might be factual, but it is not covered in grace. I said it is not covered in or governed by grace. It is not accompanied by grace. Now, how many of you know that we need the grace of God to mitigate, to some extent, the effects of truth? Not to change truth, but to mitigate the potential effects of truth when it enters into someone's heart. Right? That's why when you're talking about disciplining a child, I mean, the root word for discipline is the same of, from which we get the word disciple. A disciple is what? One who sits at the feet of another and learns or is taught. So that the whole idea of disciplining your child is not about the corporal punishment. It that's one facet of it, but really it's about instructing your child and loving your child and correcting your child, but really the whole idea of it is that you love them into loving to learn and appreciating and recognizing that it's through this process that they're going to be brought to learn some valuable life lessons before it's too late. That's why if you just blow your top at your child, because you get sick of hearing that. And you throw your pots and pans down and you go into the other room on a hunt. That's not going to turn out well. Has anyone ever done that? Don't raise your hands. Now, why does that usually, now listen, why does that usually happen? Here's why. Because the mentality is this. I'm going to leave disciplining my child as a last resort instead of a first one. 
You know what the Bible says? That's a first resort when it's done in love because that's good. If I'm not viewing things biblically, then disciplining my child is going to be the last thing, the, the last resort, which is why it usually is. Throwing things down and going to the other room. Hunting. And God help the kid when you find him. You're just going to warm his behind. I mean, I've done that a couple times. I said a couple times <laughs> when our kids were little. But let me tell you, the bulk of the time, it was, okay, that's it. Now get the paddle. We had a custom-made paddle. <laughs> Why? Because we never felt it a good idea to use your hand. The same hand that reaches and loves and hugs should not be used as an instrument of, of punishment. Let the instrument be the instrument and let your hand be your hand. So when it came time that I was reaching for the paddle, it's all over. And so we'd say, okay, now we told you don't do that. We told you don't do that. Bang, we paddle, a couple shots. Here. A couple shots. Our objective was not to make him cry. Well, listen carefully. Our objective was to break the will of rebellion. That led them to not listen, not listen, not listen, not make you say something 50 times before. No, no, see, that's, that's the thing that needs to be broken. The objective is not to make a child cry. It's to break the will that can cause them to run out into a road by not listening and get hit by a car and killed. To put their hand on a stove that they've been told a hundred times, don't go near. You understand? To go near an electric fence that they've been told a hundred times. But because they haven't been taught to listen in any of these areas, they wind up getting really hurt. Anyhow, so we would use the paddle, and then guess what we would do? We would then sit them down, wipe their tears, we would explain why we did what we did, what God's word says about that, our heart of love toward them, that we love them enough to take time to discipline them. Because the Bible says, if you don't discipline your child, it proves to the world and to them that you don't love them. You love your convenience and not being inconvenienced more than you love them. And you're setting them up to be a rebel in the world and get disciplined by secular authorities. Principals, school teachers, the police department, and worse. Then guess what we would do? We would pray after all that. And many times we made our children pray. Repent to the Lord for not listening to mommy and daddy and not listening and, and not even recognizing the fact that they were violating God's word by not listening. And Lord, forgive me, you know, blah, blah, blah. And guess what? When that was over, we would love them, hug them, kiss them, and maybe get some ice cream together. I mean, a Jim Dandy solves a lot of problems. <laughs> <from friendlies. laughs> Covers a multitude of problems. You see what I'm saying? And it was over. That was over. Wow. We were discipling them. We were causing them to learn why that's not good. Why listening is good. Because if they don't listen to us, how are they going to ever listen to the Lord and obey Him? Amen. When He says, if you do this, you'll be cursed. If you do this, that will hurt you. If you do this and you know, blow your parents off. It will not go well with you in this life. That's what the Bible says in Ephesians 6. Obeying and honoring your parents is the first commandment with promise. Which is what? That it may go well with you and that you don't have a cursed life. On that basis, I don't care what the, the prevailing psycho babble is. We warm their behinds when they needed it. 
I couldn't care less what these supposed studies show. They're of the world. I don't care. His answers are always right. Never will be wrong, never change, never need to change. You know why? Because this Bible was never written to a culture, an era, or a time frame. It was written to the human condition, which was messed up then, it's messed up today, and it'll be more messed up tomorrow. And this is the antidote. That's why it never goes out of style, never goes out of date, always relevant. Because truth never goes out of style. How many of you know that if you bring an excellent attitude, an excellent work ethic, an excellent mentality, an excellent appearance, and an excellent spirit to your job, chances are you're going to move up the ladder. I don't care how messed up your boss is. Good things gravitate. It's like a magnetic thing. Good things come to those who move with a spirit of excellence. That has always been the case. Think about Daniel. 3,000 years ago, it worked for him. Joseph, 1,000 years ago, and it will work for you. Because that truth is a universal, transcendent truth that will never fail. If you're a slacker, you'll get what's coming to you. The lousiest jobs never get a raise, never seem to get ahead, always this, always that. Well, what are you bringing? You're bringing your F game and want an A raise. You'll get a raise on the heel of someone's boot and you're behind. Now, it's very important that we establish this in our young people. I want to, because how many of you know that sometimes our young people can think that they're, they know it all? <laughs> not Chris Luster, though. Not, <laughs> not Christopher. All right. But I want to read you this little thing about that. It says, the arrogance of the young is the direct result of not knowing enough consequences. The turkey that every day greedily approaches the farmer who tosses him grain is not himself wrong. It is just that no one has ever told him about Thanksgiving. <laughs> it's still bouncing around somewhere in this area. Someone catch that back there. All right. Because I heard a little, hmm, mm hmm, hmm. All right, that's a thought from the far side you need to play around with. No. <laughs> Praise God. Speak the truth in love. This is a project for this week. You ready for a little homework assignment? Yeah. And it's really from the last scripture here under point number three, the very last scripture you have on your outlines. It says, Worry. Other translations substitute the word worry for the word concern or anxiety. Anxiety, worry, fears, concerns weigh a person down. Have you ever been weighed down with a fear, a concern, an anxiety? But guess what? An encouraging word cheers a person up. Here's your project. Here's your homework assignment. I want you to try and encourage everyone that you meet for the rest of this week. On Monday, you can tell them they're a loser. But for the rest of this week, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> for, for the rest of this week. For the rest of this week, seriously, challenge yourself to find something about which, about which you can encourage someone. You get into that kind of habit. You get that into your mindset. You get that onto your radar screen. You're going to see how that will change your life. 
Because any fool can be negative. Any fool can see what's wrong with someone. Any fool, therefore, can be a critic. But guess what, guys? You'll never see a statue built to a critic. Because the world will forget fools and critics. But however, you're going to find that many times they'll build statues to people who have been criticized by critics their whole life and yet still achieved. But it takes real character to be positive in a negative world. It takes real character to be an encourager in a discouraging world. It takes real character to be someone who cares in an uncaring world. The question is, are you okay with being mediocre? Or do you want to move on the highway of excellence? You see, you can teach a parrot to swear. <laughs> that takes no intelligence at all. But it takes genuine character to be positive and to speak the truth in love <laughs> and to put other people first. Real quickly, let's finish up here. Number four. In this journey, here's what we need to do. Ask Jesus for help every day. We need that, don't we? Because we can't do this on our own power. It's impossible. We can never manage our mouth just by ourselves. Why is that? Because our mouth is really not the problem. The Lord says when you have a problem with your mouth, it's not a problem with your mouth. It's a problem that's in your heart. The Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, a person's going to wind up inevitably speaking. That's why if you really want to know something about someone, you usually can't find it out in five minutes. But get around them for a day or two. What, who and what they really are, what's really important to them, is what they'll wind up talking about incessantly. Once you get them talking, should they be more introverted? Some people, you crank them up, let them go, and they'll talk all day and night. <laughs> however, however it comes out, what's really important to them? What they really love, what really interests them, is what they'll wind up finding a way to talk about. Because out of the abundance of what's really in the heart, the mouth will speak. That's why when somebody in a fit of rage blows up and says all kinds of mean things, I don't believe it's just, oh, in the spur of the moment they said this. No, at some point, the seeds of those statements found root in their spirit. And when the safeguards were released, that's what came out of that pressurized thing. So it's very important. You see, the mouth simply reveals what's in my heart. The heart, it's like the window, the mouth and the heart are like windows to the soul. It, the mouth can be the display of my character when it's in motion. Now, look at the scripture under point four. This is what David prayed in Psalm 141. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord, and keep watch over the door of my lips. That's a great prayer to pray. And then from the Living Bible, I've just chosen another translation of the verse 3. Uh, I like this one. Help me, Lord, to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> now look at what Jesus said here. What comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And then Ezekiel 18.31. He said, rid yourself of all the offenses that you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Wow, isn't that powerful? Yeah. Now, there was a, a, a little story I was reading where one guy was complaining of this community that they had worms in their water. That was gross. And I showed a guy with a glass of water and there were a couple of worms floating around in there. And so when I was thinking about this message, I was thinking about the parallel. Whatever is in your well will be in your water.
you have worms? You can start a new business. I've got worms. I know. So the, the remedy here is, Lord, keep a watch over the door of my lips, and Lord, give me a new heart. Take the heart that is more prone to do wrong things or say the wrong things and give me a heart that would more gravitate to want to do what you want me to do. Let's go to number five. We're going to close with this. Guys having a good time? Number five is very, very critical. Always consider the long-term long consequences of your actions. There are things that seem right. You know, the Bible says there, there, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end of that pathway is the way of death. There are things that seem right to us because they seem justifiable. But it doesn't mean that because something is right that it needs to be said. It doesn't mean that saying something that's true or accurate will not come, that will be free of long-term consequences. So even though I know something is true and something is right, that doesn't mean that I'm going to say it. It doesn't mean I should say it. The first thing I'm going to do is ask myself, contemplate this question internally. If I do say this, what is the potential, what are the potential long-term consequences of going there? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because once you open a can of worms, once you go somewhere, you can't turn back. So the first thing I'm going to consider besides, is it true? Is it factual? Is it right? Is, secondly, Holy Spirit, do you want me to say this? Third, in terms of crafting what I'm going to say and how I'm going to say it, what are the long term consequences of going here. Because maybe, maybe saying it tomorrow can solve a lot of problems. Instead of saying it today. Maybe praying on it overnight, the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom. He will give you an anointing so that you'll know have the right words in the right manner, and it will serve as a key that unlocks this logjam instead of <laughs> consider the long term consequences. Now, I've put a whole passage of scripture here. It's about this guy, Rehoboam. Rehoboam was one of Solomon's sons. Rehoboam was next in line to take the kingship of Israel. So here he is. He he comes and he says, well, I suppose the first thing I should do is get some counsel. Because he had a group of people that came to him and they said, listen, we want to come and serve under you like we did your father, but tell us how you're going to rule. Tell us what the game rules are going to be. So first thing he says, well, I'll let you know in three days. So he goes to his, the elders, the people that ruled with his father. And he said, guys, you're much older than me, you're wise. How should, what, what should I tell these people? And they said, well, what you should really tell the people is, I'm going to be kind to you, I'm going to be fair to you, and we can do this thing together. In other words, I'm going to exercise good, godly, but firm leadership in your life. Okay. So now what does he do? Instead of taking that counsel, the Bible says he goes to his peers. Boy, that's a big mistake. That's like three knuckles heads in a bar going to a fourth guy. <laughs> and so what does he do? He blows off counsel of the elders that actually have wisdom, and he goes to the bar stool, and he gets counsel from his peers. And what do they say? Hey, wait a minute. You tell these clowns that just by asking that kind of question, what's your leadership going to be like in our life? You tell them. If you thought my father's hand was heavy, my finger will be heavier than his whole fist. 
I'm the new sheriff in town, and there'll be no doubting my words. My word is law. And if you thought it was tough under him, oh boy. Guess what he did? He split the kingdom in two. It ruined the nation. Ten tribes of, within Israel left and went north. And this guy, Rehoboam, only had one, his tribe and one more tribe. And they stayed in Jerusalem and parked south. And it ruined the nation for many, 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 many years because of foolish leadership. He did not consider the long-term consequences. What did he do? In his view, he pressed send. And it was, I'll slap the taste out of your mouth if you even question my leadership. And it was a terrible thing. Now, how many of you know that if we're going to move in wisdom and in self-control, part of thinking has to do with what we're going to say, what we should say, and what we should zip it. The other part is pondering the long-term consequences, counting the cost before you sit down, Jesus said, and build a tower. You sit down and count the cost to see whether or not you have enough money to do it. He said, because otherwise, when you get halfway in a, let's say someone's going to build a home, and they get halfway through their home building project, then you run out of money. You see it all the time. Developers that get in, they want to be big shots. They get in over their heads and they lose their shirts. The funding is stopped right in the middle of 18 houses being built. And they sit there. In many cases, they have to be demolished when they sit there long enough. And so what is it? You know, Jesus said this, because otherwise you get halfway through, and then everyone walking by said, what a fool, started this project and ran out of money, because he didn't sit down and count things accurately. He didn't count the cost well. He's a fool. Now, how many of you know that someone can do foolish things by not counting and considering the potential consequences of saying or doing something as opposed to refraining. And I'm telling you, in the heat of a moment, what's in your heart is going to want to come out. And if you violated two or three of these principles, in the heat of a moment, you're, it's going to seem right, it's going to seem righteous, and it's going to seem justifiable to, you know, speak the truth! The only problem, it will not be in love. It'll be in passion. It will be in vindication, self-vindication. It will be trying to punish the other person or put them down or build your case at any cost. But the long-term consequences can be very destructive. And you see the last scripture right there, Psalm 19. David said, who can understand his errors? In other words, who can understand the depth of what we're capable of? Question. Then he makes a prayer out of that reality. He said, Lord, cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. In other words, things I don't even know are dumb and violate your law. Let these things no longer have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless. Then I'll be innocent of great transgression. And then he says, finally, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And I'll conclude with this. Sid Baxter said, quote, The proof that you have God's Spirit in your life and that He is working in you does not lie in the fact that you can speak in an unknown tongue, but more that you know how to control the tongue that you do know about. Let's stand, please.